I've been responsible for my money since I was about 19. That's over 10 years ago. And in that time, life has twisted and turned in ways that I could never have imagined. I got fired from a job. I moved overseas on a complete whim. COVID happened. I also got some money in inheritance that I was not expecting. And that's not to mention all the ways that I have changed. I am not the same person today as I was at 21. That tired cliche about change being the only constant in life, that's true. And if you think too hard about it, it is absolutely terrifying that the things that you decide now with regards to your money will have an impact on your life in 30 or 40 or 50 years time. Given life's uncertainties, my favorite takeaways from the psychology of money were all about leaning into uncertainty to plan your financial future instead of trying to plan around hard and fast rules. Right, so let's look at four principles that you can use to confidently plan your financial future, even if you don't know what that future looks like. Thanks, Morgan Housel, for these. Understand the role of luck in financial success and failure. In any given scenario, you are just as likely to get lucky as you are to get unlucky. And the tricky thing is that even looking back with hindsight, it's impossible to know how much of a role luck played in your success or failure. So when it comes to your finances, you've got to understand that things could go either way for you and therefore put most of your time, money, resources into things that you can control. Here's an example. So lots of people in our parents' generation think that they are property experts and are very keen to give advice about what we should be doing with regards to investing in houses. I am thinking of a lot of dads I know in this category in particular. But the problem with this advice is that it's basically impossible to replicate their success. And that's because the housing market has changed so much. That generation bought houses in the 80s, where house prices were much lower relative to income, making mortgages, even ones with pretty high interest, much more affordable for middle income couples. And then in the meantime, house prices have gone way up thanks to an increase in the demand for housing. Then COVID happened. And here in the UK, that meant there were a bunch of government policies which really drove up the house prices. So yeah, some people were really savvy property investors back in the 80s, and they've done super well. But the fact is that even people who know nothing about property will have had a house that has increased in value more than they could ever have imagined, which is, of course, wonderful and amazing for them. The crux of my point here is that the world is a very different place and so if you are trying to use their advice as a roadmap, you are basically guaranteed to fail because if you follow the exact steps that they followed, you are not going to have the same outcome. In short, never assume that outcomes are a direct result of hard work or of decisions. Instead, look at context and look for patterns if you're hoping to emulate somebody else's roadmap. And on the flip side, bad luck also comes into the equation. So if you have failed or some of your plans have gone tits up where finances are concerned, don't give up because as long as it wasn't reckless, the chances are if you keep going, things will get better. Leave room for error. We all know that life is full of surprises. You can see this throughout hundreds and thousands of years of history. But also if you look back on your own life, it follows that there's a good chance things won't always go to plan. So you need to acknowledge this, get used to that fact, and then put in place a margin of error for every single financial decision that you make so that you can avoid some of life's nastier surprises. Okay, I'm gonna give you another housing related example to explain this. So imagine we've gone back to pre-COVID, you are ready to buy a house, you've got your deposit all lined up, you're excited, you're ready to go. And one of your friends who works in crypto comes along and says, hey, I have this amazing opportunity for you. And you think, okay, great. This person knows what they're doing. I trust them. You invest all of your savings. And the idea is that within three years, you can make a profit and buy a much nicer house than you're able to afford right now. So you go all in. Unfortunately, as you probably would have predicted, in this example, the crypto price plummets. And because you've got all of your savings in there, you freak out, you panic, you sell at a loss. And the outcome is that you have less money than you started with and you are now further away from buying a house than ever. That was an oversimplified example, but the idea is you always need to plan for a range of outcomes rather than having one specific little thing that you're aiming for. And remember that risk is inevitable. 
So the trick is to assess the risk. And if it is so big that if that risk happens, you will end up financially paralyzed, then you definitely need to increase your margin of error. And this allows you to weather all kinds of outcomes, even if they are ones that you are trying to avoid. Accept that you'll change and so will your financial goals. I've already pointed out how our values and priorities change as we grow older. And just like you didn't know what would be important to you when you were 35, you don't know what will be important to you when you're 50. And the lesson that Morgan Housel espouses in this book is that because of all the uncertainty, the best way forward is to make decisions based in moderation rather than going to the extreme ends. He talks about a 25 year old who is hell bent on making money and they do this by working hard all hours of the day and night and they sacrifice a social life, traveling, all the fun stuff that people in their 20s do because that's what feels important to them. Then they hit 35 and they realize that actually they have way more than they need and they now own a house, have children, they have a bunch of responsibilities, which means living a little is much more complicated. So looking back, they're now thinking, I really wish I had lived a little more when I was younger. On the flip side, as a younger person, you might decide that you actually are super into simple, low, low cost lifestyle. You're happy to live like in a yurt, in a field somewhere. And that might work out fine, but you also might get to 65 or 70 and realize that you now don't have enough money to retire on and you prefer to sleep in a comfy bed. So the point here is that whichever end of the extreme you go to, there is a high chance that you will end up with some kind of regret. And the only way to avoid that is to try and walk down a middle road. Another really good point here is that people change and so do your plans. And so if you do start out life feeling like you are going to work your ass off and climb a, some kind of corporate ladder, but then you realize that you don't want that anymore, don't succumb to some cost bias. Just because you made a decision about your future when you were 18 and put a lot of time and energy into building this career does not make a good enough reason for you to continue living a life that you do not like for another 30 years. You don't need a reason to save. This lesson is so simple, it's a bit mind blowing. And that is saving is the only form of investment that has a 100% guarantee on return in, on investment. And in a world full of uncertainty, that is a pretty nice lever to be able to pull. The other thing is that it's really great to save just for saving's sake. You don't always have to have a specific reason or goal that you're working towards because you never know when you might need extra cash. Generally, the rule of thumb is the higher the risk, the higher the return. However, all you need is a 1% chance of your investment not panning out combined with a little bit of bad luck and you might have a problem. By comparison, saving money is pretty much risk free. And the best thing about it is that you can control how much you save by controlling how much you spend. And then that feeds into itself nicely because if you spend less, then you need fewer savings to be able to survive. Save more than you think that you'll need and simplify your spending so that you need less. Thank you so much for watching and um, maybe don't tell your dad that I think his advice is irrelevant. See you in the next video.